So the topic of my talk today is Damodara Gupta's Kuttani Mata, an 8th century satire for, uh, from Kashmir. Uh, you can see the my, my uh, bio details, including my email. So if anyone would like to contact me in the future, most welcome. I don't hesitate to do so. As um, Sharma has mentioned, um, Dominic Goodall and myself uh, prepared a uh, new critical edition and an English verse translation of the Kuttani Mata uh, about 10 years ago now. It was published in uh, uh, the Netherlands uh, by Egbert Forsten. And then later it was uh, reprinted by Brill. So it's I think it's still available through uh, Brill. And um, as Sharma mentioned, uh, there had already been uh, editions of this text before. Uh, the mo two most important ones are uh, on, this, on the slide. You can see it on the slide. So one was prepared by Tripathi. Um, uh, in, uh, it was printed in uh, Varanasi. Uh, it's a reprint, actually, of the original Bombay edition, which was uh, uh, published in 19. 24. And the other uh, edition was uh, made by Madhusudan Kaul, and it was published in Calcutta in 1944. Um, now, the question may arise, if there were already two quite good editions of this text, why was it necessary to publish it again? Why was it necessary to uh, make, uh, to prepare a new edition? Now, these two editions, Tripathi's Bombay edition and Madhusudan Kao's Calcutta edition, were prepared independently from each other. Uh, Madhusudan Kao's was published in 1944, but actually it had been ready decades before, but its publication was delayed, delayed, and then eventually it was published in 1944. So these two editions are completely independent from each other, and the manuscript material, material they used is different. And the result is uh, the text which they established is quite uh, different. Um, Tripathi based his edition mostly on the, on the Western manuscripts uh, of the Kuttani Mata, which were uh, transmitted in Gujarat, and uh, uh, Madhusudan Kaul based his edition on the Eastern manuscripts, which are preserved in, uh, uh, at the Asiatic Society in, in Calcutta. And as I say, the result was uh, quite, quite different. So what we decided to do with Dominic um, to collect all those manuscripts which were available uh, at that time, both the Western and both the Eastern manuscripts. Plus, we managed to um, get a copy uh, of a manuscript from Nepal, which nobody had uh, used before. And using all this manuscript material and all the available editions to, to prepare a new edition on the basis of all the material avail available to us. And um, as uh, Sharma mentioned, there, there are also quite a, lot, a number of uh, translations uh, of, uh, of this text into German, Japanese. Yes, there is a Hungarian translation, which is complete. Uh, these um, translations were mostly prepared on the basis of the Calcutta uh, edition. Uh, there hadn't been... Uh, a very good English translation before, so we decided to prepare a new English translation. And what is an, a bit unusual about our translation is that it is an English verse, so it's a verse uh, translation. So just to show you a couple of slides uh, on the manuscript material we used, this is uh, one of the most important manuscripts of the Kuttani Mata, which is kept uh, at, the, at the library of the Asiatic Society in Calcutta. Uh, it's a palm leaf uh, manuscript in Magadan uh, script. And uh, on the slide, what you see is actually the last two pages of the manuscript. And if you, if you have a look at the, the second page, the last page of the manuscript, you, you can see that uh, we can differentiate two different scripts on this folio, on this page. And this is quite important because uh, we think with Dominic that um, 
the text of the Kuttanimata as we have it today contains four, um, four or five closing verses which are probably not authorial. It's probably not, they are probably not written by Damodara Gupta. And they are contained only in this manuscript. And as you see on the slides, these last few verses, these concluding verses, are written in a different script. And they are actually written after a colophon. So um, we, we think with Dominic that these were added later to provide uh, a closure to provide an ending uh, to the to the text, which which ending might have been missing uh, at the time, and uh, but this new ending, which was added uh, later, it's quite hasty, and um, it's probably not by Damod Daragupta. Uh, this uh, manuscript is is the one which uh, hadn't been used before. So this is the Nepalese uh, manuscript, uh, which we identified with uh, Dominic, and we used it for the first time. Um, it's a palm leaf uh, manuscript in Nevari uh, script. This one is undated, uh, but it could be from the 13th, 14th century, probably. And as you can see, it's not in the best uh, shape. It's, uh, it's a bit fragmentary. But uh, still, nevertheless, it proved to be uh, very useful and important um, uh, in our work and in, in preparing the uh, edition. So, um, what, do, what do we know about Damodara Gupta and his work? We are quite uh, lucky, in a sense, um, that um, the Kashmirian Chronicle of Kings, written by Kalhana, in the 12th century, the Raja Tarangini mentions Damodara Gupta by name in, in, in this verse, which you can see on the slide. And um, uh, the verse uh, says that King uh, Jayapida appointed uh, Damodara Gupta as his chief advisor, Dhuryam Dhira Dhisachivam. And uh, Damodara Gupta is said to be Kuttanimata Karinam, the author of the Kuttanimata. So it is absolutely certain that this is the same Damodara Gupta. And this information helps us to place Damodara Gupta in time and space. So he worked, he was a Kashmirian, he, he lived in Kashmir and worked in Kashmir. And uh, he worked under the patronage of King uh, Jayapida. Uh, of Kashmir, who ruled uh, at the end, uh, at the very end of the 8th century and the beginning, very beginning of the 19th century. So therefore, we think that um, the Kuttanimata was probably, uh, must have been uh, written uh, around 800 and uh, in, in Kashmir. Now, um, uh, if you if we if we read uh, the story of uh, uh, the history of uh, King Jayapida in the Raja Tarangini, uh, we we find interesting similarities between Jayapida's adventures, as narrated by Kalhana in the Raja Tarangini, and between uh, a story in the Kuttani Mata. Uh, so uh, Jayapida conducted a kind of tour of adventure. Uh, on the, in the course of which he uh, went to Pundravardhana uh, in east, uh, north, in the northeast uh, of India, where he visited a Kartikeya temple in which he uh, watched the dance performance of a dancing uh, Kamala, and they uh, fell in love with each other. So there's a nice uh, love story in the Raja Tarangini about the about about King Jayapida. Now this this story is suspiciously similar to a story in the Kuttani Mata in Damodara Gupta's work, in which a prince visits a temple, a Shiva temple in Benares, watches the performance of a Sanskrit uh, play, the Ratnavali, falls in love uh, with the dancing girl there. So it's a suspiciously similar story, and we can speculate who imitated whom. Um, I would think that uh, probably uh, there was a story about King Jayapida, um, and, uh, which, which, which probably has some kernel of, of truth uh, in it. 
and uh, Damodara Gupta based his invented story in the Kuttanimata on the story of the king uh, and um, um, later on Kalhana uh, related uh, this story in the Raja Tarangini. So um, this uh, shows that uh, when we read the Kuttanimata, we, all, we are always faced with multiple meanings and multiple possible interpretations of the text. Some of these meanings are hidden to us, and um, um, especially the historical layers of the text, the historical background, the historical meanings of the text are mostly hidden uh, to us, but perhaps in this case we can get a glimpse of, of, of a historical meaning. So I would think that when uh, people listen to the the recitation of the Kuttanimata in 8th century or early 9th century Kashmir, um, the story of their own king, King Jayapida, might have come uh, to their mind. And this added um, uh, an additional layer of meaning um, to the text. Um, uh, so the Kutani Mata was written about around 800, and interestingly, in the same period, uh, two uh, other uh, poems, kavyas, were composed uh, in uh, India, which are quite similar in form. Bhagpati Raja's Gaudavahu and Kouhala's Lilavai. Uh, the form uh, is, uh, in this case, um, and it's the same form as that of the Kuttani Mata, uh, uh, all these poems, these three poems, were written in Arya or Giti uh, meter, and uh, they consist uh, uh, about uh, 1,200, 1,300 verses, and uh, they are written in a continuous form, so there are no chapter divisions. Uh, of course, there are great differences. Both the Gaudavaho and the Lilavai were written in Prakrit, in Maharashtri, Prakrit and Kuttari Mata is in Sanskrit, but um, nevertheless, all these three um, poems, these three kavyas, belong to the genre of katha akyaika. Lilavai is uh, evidently a katha. The Kuttari Mata can also be um, um, also be classified as a as a katha. The Gaudavahu is a is more a historical. Uh, poem. It has a historical narrative, so it's, it, it falls more into the category of the Akiaika, perhaps. Nevertheless, mm, these three uh, kavyas are um, narrative, uh, narrative, so they belong to the genre of narrative uh, poetry. Bhoja, King Bhoja, uh, in his, in his uh, Shingara Prakasha, classifies the Kuttani Mata as a Nidarshana, uh, katha, uh, uh, as a work of illustration, an illustrating uh, poem. It was uh, quite popular um, in the early medieval period in India. The Kuttani Mata was quoted in Subhashita collections, such as the Sharingadhara Paddati and uh, the Subhashita Avali. And um, as Sharma mentioned, Kshimindra also knew uh, the Kuttani Mata and caught it in the Kavikantha Prana. And as, as you probably all know, Kshemendra uh, wrote an important work on courtesans, the Samaya Matrika, which was most probably inspired by the Kuttani Mata. Uh, the Kuttani Mata is also referred to in the Nagara Sarvaswa, which is a work on uh, erotic literature, Kama Shastra. And um, the Nagara Sarvasva refers to the Kuttani Mata as an authority on Kama Shastra. So the Kuttani Mata could be read as a work of poetry, Kavya, but it could also be read as a, as a work on Kama Shastra. Uh, when we read uh, the Kuttani Mata, uh, the intertextuality of the text is often evident. So um, um, there were, we can discover several earlier poems and poets who influenced Damodara Gupta's style and diction. Uh, for instance, Subandhu's Vasavadatta, the famous prose uh, uh, work uh, of Subandhu, is, is one of these clear influences. 
for instance, uh, the, the, the use of shleshas, the use of overheard verses and fragments of conversation, the characters over here uh, in the story, this makes it, uh, this makes the Kuttarimata very similar to the Vasavadatta in, in several places. Or the very beginning of the Kuttanimata, which uh, starts with a description of Benares, uh, contains uh, shlishas and similes and other alankaras, uh, which, uh, which we find uh, already in Subandhu's Vasavadatta in the description of Pataliputra. So uh, the Vasavadatta is a clear intertext, was a clear intertext in, in the case of uh, Damodara Gupta. Um, Mm, yes. Um, so, just uh, just to tell you very briefly uh, what the what the Kuttanimata is about. Um, uh, the Kuttanimata is typical typically constructed in a way uh, that a katha is constructed. So there is a frame story, and within that frame story, we have internal uh, stories uh, inserted. So the frame story is about uh, Vikarala. She is the Kuttani, she is the board, the madam, who teaches Malati, the young Vesya in Banares. So Malati approaches Vikarala for advice. And then uh, the whole uh, Kuttani Mata is a teaching of uh, Vikarala to Malati. But the text contains two long moral tales. The first is um, uh, the story, the tragic, uh, the tragic love story uh, of uh, Sundarasena and uh, Haralata. And the second is uh, the story of Samarabhata, uh, Prince uh, Samarabhata and uh, Manjari. Now, uh, the, uh, these inserted moral uh, tales again illustrate that uh, when we read the Kuttani Mata, we, uh, we always deal with layers of meanings. And um, um, uh, there is always a kind of multivalence in, in the meanings and interpretations of the various uh, stories uh, of the text. So if we, if we read uh, the story of Sundarasena and Haralata in itself, it is a tragic story. Sundarasena is a young Brahmin, Haralata is a Vesha, who fall in love with each other, and it is a genuine love between two young uh, persons. But uh, one day Sundarasena uh, receives his father's letter and he has to return home, so he has to leave Haralata who cannot bear uh, their separations, and Haralata dies uh, in, in her grief. So it is really a very tragic story, and uh, it can be read as a, as a tragic story. And uh, actually, it is possible to extract, to take out uh, this story from the Kuttani Mata, and just read it in itself as a tragic love story. And, Interestingly, this was done already in the medieval period in Nepal. Uh, uh, a play, a drama, uh, is preserved, unfortunately, in a fragmentary form, which was uh, written in Nepal in the Middle Ages, a Sanskrit play, which was based exactly on this tragic story. So the Kutari Mata was known in Nepal, was read uh, in Nepal, and somebody in the 14th, 15th century, decided that the tale, the tragic uh, story of Sundarasena and Haralata deserves in itself to be transformed into a play. And somebody wrote a play on the basis of this. And uh, I edited this uh, fragment uh, of this play um, a couple of years ago in a, in a journal. So it was, and it is possible to read uh, this tragic story in itself. but. Actually, uh, this uh, story of Sundarasena and Haralata is part of a bigger story. It's part of the story of Vikarala and Malati. And um, in the frame story, uh, Vikarala tells Malati that uh, she should uh, narrate this tragic story to her lover uh, in the morning after their lovemaking. 
and um, why should uh, Malati uh, narrate this story to her lover? In order to prove that courtesans, Vaishyas, are in fact capable of genuine and sincere love. So, and therefore, and, and thereby, uh, to win the confidence uh, of her lover. So Malati narrates the tragic story of Sundarasena and Haralata, and after, um, after she finishes the story, uh, she should, as, as Vikarala teaches her, uh, Malati should draw the conclusion. And it's very interesting and very characteristic of Damodara Gupta that the conclusion is not uh, self-evident. The conclusion is also multivalent. So Malati should, on the one hand, say that, well, you see, my, my dear, talking to her lover, uh, it is better if courtesans do not fall in love with their clients. It is better not to show genuine uh, love. And uh, uh, even if courtesans are not really in love with their clients, they can still uh, cause pleasure uh, to their clients, to their lovers. Just like um, uh, turtles and, and horses and uh, pigeons or actors are not, uh, they don't feel genuine, genuine emotions, still they can uh, cause pleasure to the spectators or their owners. So this is one side of, of the lesson of the story of Sundarasin and Haralata. But then Malati draws another kind of lesson too, which is that, well, my dear, uh, actually uh, the, this story also illustrates that genuine love, real love, is also possible between Vaishyas and their clients. So it is not, it is not impossible. So, um, uh, that uh, man and Vaishyas can really fall in love with each other. So the, the lesson, the conclusion, the moral lesson of this tragic love story is two-sided. So, um, and, and then the client of Malati can draw his own conclusion for himself uh, if, he, if he wants to. And uh, as Vikarala tells Malati, the real purpose, the real goal of narrating the tragic uh, love story of Sundarasin and Haralata uh, uh, to the man is uh, that uh, so that uh, Malati uh, can uh, seduce the man, uh, uh, can make uh, uh, her client av uh, Avarjita Manasa. So uh, the, the main purpose is sed seduction and winning the confidence of the man. So um, all these all these meanings, all these layers are are there uh, in in the story. And uh, Damodara Gupta's uh, um, way of presenting these stories is always multivalent and always has uh, multiple meanings and multiple possible interpretations. Um, now. Um, the second story, uh, the story of Samarabhata and Manjari, is uh, uh, narrated by Vikarala, the Kuttani herself, to Malati, the young Vesha, as an illustration of a successful Vesha. Manjari is a dancing girl attached to a temple in Banaras, and Samarabhata is a prince who watches the performance of Manjari. He falls in love with Manjari, who is also a Vesha, of course. And then Manjari successfully seduces Samarabhata, takes all his money, and then uh, ditches him, and then leaves him. So this is how a Vesha should really behave. Um, um, and uh, uh, a Vesha, th this story illustrates, according to Vikarala, the Kuttani, that a Vesha should uh, consider her own interests and her main purpose uh, should be to get uh, most uh, out of her client, get uh, as, as much money uh, as she can from her client. And when um, she has, as, as the text uh, says, sucked dry uh, the client, uh, she can abandon him and uh, ditch him. So, um, 
uh, if when we read uh, the Kuttani Mata, apart from these stories, these narratives, we get a vivid tableau of e 8th century Indian urban life. So how life was in Banaras, for instance, uh, or Ataliputra, and uh, the way uh, Damodara Gupta presents this uh, very um, uh, colorful uh, urban life is uh, through the voices of people. So we we always uh, overhear conversations of uh, various characters from urban society, and um, the, the the text of the Kuttari Mata is is full of quotations of these these voices of people, these discussions, chatting, chatters, and um, conversations uh, which are overheard uh, by the characters. Um, the Kutani Mata is on one hand, of course, a satirical uh, work, but it's not just a scathing satire. Uh, Damodara Gupta also shows deep empathy with those who, are, who have drawn the shortest straws in society. So Danudara Gupta is very, um, 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 uh, is very full of uh, empathy, for instance, towards the abandoned uh, Vesha in love, Haralata. So the portray, portrayal of Haralata, who, as you remember, uh, dry, uh, dies uh, out of grief uh, when her lover abandons her. So her portrayal is full of sympathy, full of empathy uh, on the part of Damodara Gupta. Also, Damodara Gupta is, uh, has, uh, shows deep empathy towards married women who are seduced into a socially ruinous, adulterous relationship. So, there is a lot of empathy in the text, uh, but also there is a lot of satire. And Damodara Gupta ridicules um, foremost, first and foremost religious hypocrites, and also those who are tiresomely self-important, and men of rank uh, with more money than sense. And um, I have already mentioned the multivalence uh, uh, of the text, uh, how different interpretations are possible on the story level. But also, uh, this multivalence characterizes the text on the level of words and sentences. And uh, we find uh, a lot of shleshas uh, in the text. Uh, which again uh, make uh, many of its uh, parts and, and paragraphs and sentences uh, multivalent uh, and mat multiple interpretation is, is possible. Okay, so uh, to show you uh, um, an example of the satirical uh, side uh, of the Kuttani Mata, um, I would like to quote uh, a couple of uh, uh, verses here. And um, uh, on the right side, you can uh, read our verse translation, which we, which we made uh, with uh, Dominic. So here, um, uh, the, context, uh, the context is that, uh, again, the chatter of uh, city dwellers uh, is overheard by uh, one of the main characters. And um, somebody, a woman, um, uh, tells these verses to her friend. Yuyam grihita brisikach, kushakar no vidrita danda kashaya, lukas parsha shanki, krita pasaru vilokayan parshvau, kurva no mal navratam, utpadita sakala vaishna vashadhach, harisha sanam prapannas, tripuranta kadarsha napadishena, Trainam pasyati yukya sakaksham varjitanya janadrishti kumudini mamahridaya gatam havitavyam vyajalingina neda. So these verses about a vyajalingin, uh, a hypocrite, uh, a false uh, ascetic. And here is our translation. This Kushakarna over here, who's clutching his ascetic seat, bearing a staff and saffron robes shrinking aside in nervous dread of other people touching him, dancing about from side to side by keeping up a vow of silence, inspiring religious faith in each and every Vaishnava, 
This votary of Vishnu's writ, pretending here to visit Shiva, ogles the women artfully by dodging, catching others' eyes. That plaster saint Komudini must satisfy my inclinations. So here there is a very nice and funny portrayal of a Vaishnava ascetic who uh, is very cautiously uh, trying to avoid uh, uh, contact with other people and outwardly he is, uh, he is a religious ascetic uh, but actually what he is doing is he is uh, watching the women ogling uh, the women uh, near a, a Shiva temple and uh, uh, one of the girls uh, says to the uh, other girl that uh, uh, this Vaishnava ascetic is, a very, is very promising, so probably I can seduce uh, him and uh, he can be my lover. And uh, just to mention, mention another intertextual uh, aspect uh, of the text, um, some of you or most of you are probably familiar with the Chatur Bhani, these uh, monologue plays, bhanas, which were transmitted in manuscripts in Kerala. And um, uh, one of these uh, bhanas, the Padma Prabritaka, contains a very similar description of a hypocrite Vaishnava called Chaksha Vadika, an adherent of the pure Vaishnava doctrine. So, Damodara Gupta was not the first one who made fun of hypocritical uh, ascetics. Uh, he had examples uh, before, uh, before him. Okay, so um, um, in uh, the last part of my talk, uh, I thought that um, I would like to show you a part of the text which illustrates very well this uh, multivalence uh, uh, of Damodara Gupta's work. And um, so it, it illustrates nicely, uh, in my opinion, how many interpretations are possible uh, of, of some of the verses and how Damodara Gupta makes some of these, uh, uh, makes the meanings of, uh, of some of these verses uncertain, ambiguous, and therefore sometimes funny. So, uh, this passage, uh, or these verses, uh, which I'm going to show, are taken from uh, Stuti. Um, uh, the context is that Prince Samarabata, this is the second half, uh, in, in the second half of the Kuttarimata, Prince Samarabhata visits a temple in Benares in order to watch a uh, dance performance, a uh, performance of a play, uh, actually. And uh, when he enters the temple, there is a Vaitalika, a bard, who sings uh, the Stuti uh, verses uh, of the prince. So we, here we have about 20, 25 uh, verses containing a Stuti, a Prashasti, a praise, an encomium uh, of, uh, of this uh, uh, chap called, uh, of this prince called Samarabhata. And um, yes, I, actually, I forgot to mention that one of the editions, Tripathi's Bombay edition, contains a very useful Sanskrit commentary by the editor himself. And there he um, classifies this uh, stuti as uh, Jaya Udaharana or Udaharana, so a kind of praise poem in, in honor of the prince. And um, this praise poem is, is full of shleshas and full of ambiguities, as, uh, as we are going to see. And uh, I'm just going to uh, show you a couple of examples. First example. Uh, so these are all the words of the Vaitalika addressed to the prince. Idrik pratapa dahano bhavatku vyapta gaganadik chakrach, drishto jalaya manu, and then our translation. Such is your valor's fire heat filling the quarters of the sky. It seems to act as water does, washing away the forehead marks of all your adversaries' wives. Or should that mean it seems quite blunt to mar the beauty of those marks? <coughs> so here we have uh, a virodha, virodha lankara. So on the one hand, we have the Pratapa Dahana, the fire of the valor of the prince. Uh, 
which is Jalaya Mana, which acts as water. It washes away the tilaka, the forehead marks of the wives of his enemy. Why? Because uh, he kills in battle uh, his enemies and the wives of these uh, enemies are mourning and they remove uh, their forehead marks, their tilakas. So the poet fancies that in a way the pratapa, the valor of the prince, uh, washes away as water, washes away the forehead marks uh, of, these, of these women. So, so far so good. Uh, it's a Virodha uh, Alankara, <coughs> and um, we can we can uh, interpret it as a as a praise, as a stuti. But uh, there is uh, something else, uh, perhaps hidden a hidden meaning. There is the age old uh, Shlesha uh, uh, of Jala and Jada. Uh, Jala and Jada, Da and La are considered the same uh, in Shlesha Kavya. So Jalaya Mana could also be interpreted as Jadaya Mana. And then it, it will be a bit more negative. Uh, Jadaya Mana would mean uh, it, is, it is blunt. Um, it is ineffective. Uh, so uh, if we see this, if you read the Shlesha into the verse, then it will be less flattering. It will be, it, it will be saying that the fire of your valor is actually ineffective uh, with respect to the forehead marks uh, of the enemies, uh, uh, of the wives of your enemy. So there is a certain uncertainty. There is a, there's a bit of uncertainty with respect to the interpretation of the verse. How should we, should we read the Shlisha here? Is it intentional? Is it there? Is it not there? So um, it's at, at, at least ambiguous. Okay, uh, next verse. Shri Palabuk Patravritu Vigraha Rasiku Vimukta Satra Ratih Rajasthitim Namunchati Rita Lakshmi ku pitava vipakshagana. So here uh, again we are going to have a virodha, virodha bhasa at least. So our translation. Feasting upon the fruits of wealth, surrounded by the vehicles, addicted to the body's pleasures, given to unconstrained largesse, your foes retain their royalty, uh, though shown by you of regal state because these opening lights should mean they're forced to feed of bilva fruit, they're clad in leaves and prone to fights, forced to abandon their delight in sacrifices lasting weeks. So here, of course, we have shleshas uh, in, in the first part of the verse. Shri Pala could mean either the fruit of wealth or Shri Pala could mean the bilva fruit. Patra could mean either leaves or it could mean uh, vehicles. Um, so it's either Vahana or Parna. Uh, vigraha could mean either battle or quarrel, or it could mean the body. Satra could mean either a kind of uh, yajna, uh, an extended Vedic sacrifice, or Satra could also mean choltri or almshouse. Um, uh, a kind of uh, choultry kitchen where free meal is available. So there is an apparent contradiction in the verse when we first hear it. So how is it possible that your enemies uh, have uh, have been um, um, shorn uh, of their regal state, Hrita Lakshmi Ko, so their Lakshmi, their majesty, their royal majesty has been taken away, and nevertheless, they are still Sri Palabuk. They still enjoy the fruits of their wealth, they are still uh, surrounded by vehicles, they still uh, enjoy uh, the pleasures of the body, or um, uh, uh, we could perhaps read uh, uh, Avimukta Satra Rati. They haven't abandoned uh, their fullness of extended uh, uh, Vedic sacrifices. And the solution of this Virodha is that we take uh, these, these words in the second meaning. So they actually live on bilva fruit, they are clad in leaves, 
uh, they are uh, prone to fights or they always quarrel and uh, they um, have uh, abandoned their delight in, uh, in these extended sacrifices or uh, they haven't abandoned their delight in uh, Chaltry kitchens. So it is possible to read this verse uh, as a stuti, but the, the primary meaning, the, uh, the um, first meaning which, which strikes us is, is, is quite negative. So um, you are not such a great king if you think you have defeated your enemies, but they are still enjoying their royal fortunes. And you have to think quite hard and have to uh, take uh, the first two lines in a second meaning and arrive uh, at another interpretation uh, to force out a stuti meaning, to force out uh, a, a, a flattering uh, meaning uh, out of the verse. Okay, uh, next example. Dadato vanchitam artham sadanu raktas yatavagriham tyaktva Stricha pari na kirtir, nagna sakta gata kaguba. So the translation, fame, kirti, fame with a woman's fickleness, although you always were devoted and gave her what she didn't want, no, gave her what she desired. Naked and loveless has left home. Um, should this really mean instead absconding with some naked monk? No, seized by bards has left your house, setting her sights on far horizons. So again, when we first uh, read, when we first hear this verse, it's a negative meaning which uh, comes through. So, uh, kirti, fame, although you have given her everything, and although you were devoted to her, kyaktva griham, has left your house, stricha palena, uh, because of her fickle nature, and um, nagna, Asakta, being naked, and Asakta, not attached to you, Gata Kakuba, she has left you. So, this is quite a negative meaning. And then again, we have to think twice, we have to think hard, and uh, uh, read uh, Nagna Sakta as a compound, and uh, take Nagna in the meaning of uh, bard, uh, or singer, uh, uh, Vandin, or Bandin. Nagna can have actually three different meanings. It can uh, either mean Vivastra, so naked, or it could mean a Kshapanaka, a naked mendicant, a naked monk, or Nagna could also mean Vandin, uh, or Bandin, uh, bard, singer. So if we take it in the last meaning, which is not the self-evident meaning, uh, then and, and we take it as a compound, then it will mean kirtir, your fame, nagna sakta, attached to a bard, attached to a singer, gata kakuha. She has reached the far horizons. She has reached distant lands. And then we have a positive uh, meaning, because the verse then simply means that uh, your fame, your kirti, is sung by professional singers, and uh, in this way, your fame, your kirti, has reached far away distant lands. But this is not the self-evident meaning. We have to force a bit uh, the verse. We have to think hard. And even if we take the most positive sense out of the verse, still, actually, the image is quite negative. It is about an unfaithful wife uh, who leaves her uh, husband. Uh, so, um, it is a very negative image, uh, after all. So, there is an ambiguance in this verse. Okay, next one. Bhavato bhavato dhairyam tenahi bhinno dhaka pranatah muktas dvayat bahavo ripavo pi prekshaka samare So, first we have a yamaka. Bhava can mean Shiva. And bhavat can mean you. So bhavato dhairyam, your firm restraint or you, your resolution or forbearance. Uh, and we have to uh, understand adhikam is greater bhavatas from Shiva. So your firm restraint surpasses Shiva's. His prostrate foe, blind andhaka, he rent apart. You see, while you have left to slip away in battle, 
many a sighted enemy. Hmm, so how should we understand this verse? So uh, the verse seems to be saying that you surpassed Shiva, you are greater than Shiva, because he killed, he rent apart Andhaka, which the name of this demon, of course, means blind, who was Pranata, bowing down, uh, became a bhakta of Shiva. And nevertheless, he killed uh, Andhaka. On the other hand, you, what you did was muktas, you have set free bahavo, ripavo, many of your enemies, many people, even though they were your enemies, ripavo, peep, in battle, samare, prekshaka, who were actually just looking on, they weren't fighting, but just they were spectators. So um, it's quite difficult to get out an absolutely positive and uh, a flattering meaning out of this verse because um, okay um, you you are greater than Shiva because he killed uh, a blind uh, in quotation marks uh, demon and you have set free uh, foresighted Prekshaka enemies but then is it such a good thing to to set free enemies in the battle uh, it doesn't sound very much praising to me. So, again, there is an ambiguity in this verse. Okay, there are a couple of more, uh, a couple of verses more, and then I finish. Atata jagatim akilam idam ashariam mayadrishtam dhanadopi nayana nandana pariharasi yad ugrasam parkam. Okay, in all my travels around the world, this is the strangest thing I've seen, that you, a pleasure to one's eyes, a veritable god of wealth, should shun the company of Shiva, no, steer away from criminals. Okay, so here in this verse again, we have a virodhavasa, an apparent contradiction. So dhanadopi, although you are dhanada, kubera, still pariharasi, you avoid ugra. Ugra can mean a, a name of Shiva. How can we uh, solve this contradiction? Uh, uh, so that uh, we have to take uh, these words in a different sense. Dhanada can of course mean somebody who gives away wealth, who is very liberal, munificent. And Ugra, we can take it in the primary meaning that uh, terrible or, or um, uh, a criminal uh, somebody. So then there will be no contradiction. Because then it will mean that Pariharasi Yadugra Sampargam, you avoid contact with criminals. So that's fine. Uh, we can get out a positive meaning from the verse. But then we can do something else. We could split uh, Nayana Nandana in a way that uh, we read Nayana Nanda Na. So, uh, Nayana Nanda could mean something like Nayana Nanda, uh, delight for the eyes, in a vocative. So, oh, you who are a delight for the eyes, and then we get a negative, na, and then we could con 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 connect that negative with what follows, na pariharasi adugra samparka. And then we will get the meaning, you don't avoid contact with crim criminals. So then, this is much less than flattery. This is quite a negative meaning. So again, there is the ambiguity in the verse. Okay, uh, really, I'm, I'm getting uh, close to finishing now. Brahmani nayayachi makasamai yo balim rishikesha nasabhavati samo bhavata danai kanishan nahridayena. Okay, translation, since Vishnu took on Brahmin form when Bali had his sacrifice and went to plead for alms from him, he isn't on a par with you, whose heart is pain to have to give, whose heart is pain to have to take, whose heart is fixed on taking only, not clear what this should mean, perhaps, whose heart is given to giving only. So, here the ambiguity lies in the last uh, line of the verse. So the verse is saying that uh, you are, uh, uh, or rather Vishnu, Rishi Kesha, is not equal to you, Nabhavati uh, Samo Bhavata, because he uh, asked for something from Bali. 
Jaja Csébalim. While you are Dana Eka Nishanna Hidayena. So the positive sense of this compound is that your heart, Hidaya, is uh, um, Nishanna, maybe uh, resting on uh, Dana Eka, only on giving. So you are solely devoted to giving. This is fine. Uh, uh, and then we are going to have the contrast between the Vyatireka, between Vishnu and between the prince. So Vishnu was uh, begging for something, Yayache, and then you are uh, devoted only to giving. But this is a strange compound because Nishanna could also mean uh, dejected, depressed. So could it mean that Hridaya, your heart is dejected only because you have to give dana or should we read bhavata adana uh, then it could also mean your heart is fixed only on taking so uh, again it is possible to interpret this this compound in several ways and it makes makes again this verse uncertain is is it a praise is it not a praise uh, it makes it ambiguous. Uh, yeah, this is a very funny one, a very fine one. Durvya vaharut pattir markya prasavo vivekita vasatih ekastvam dushagya kriti krito yena kalikala. So, translation the origin of villainy, the fountainhead of foolishness, a reservoir of judgment's dearth. This age of Kali you produce, the one successful connoisseur of vice. Unless we split the words again and read, you are alone the one true pundit who transformed this Kali age to golden krita, in which all litigations grounds have been made scarce and foolishness has been expelled and judgment reigns. So here again, uh, we have uh, uh, different possibilities how to interpret the first uh, two lines. Uh, I won't go into, for, for lack of time, I won't go into all the possibilities. Um, uh, rather, uh, I would draw attention to the ending of the verse. Uh, so, the first meaning is um, positive. Doshagya uh, could mean pandit, so somebody who knows what the faults are. This can, can have a meaning of pandita. Uh, it could also have a negative meaning, so somebody who always picks out the faults of others. Uh, now, yena uh, kriti kriti kali kala, this can be read positively, by whom the kali age has been made into the krita age, the golden age. But then there is another possibility. Uh, if we split kriti krita as kriti, Kritoyena Kalikala, by whom, so, Ekastvam Doshagya Kriti, you are the only one who knows the faults, who is an expert, Kriti, by whom Kalikala has been Krita produced. Then we get a very negative meaning. So you are the one who, who is an expert in faults, and this. Kali age, this um, uh, Iron Age here on Earth, is actually something which you have produced, Yena Krita. You see, so again, again, we can see, we can observe uh, the ambiguity uh, of this verse. Okay, maybe I uh, skip this one, and just to show the last verse uh, uh, of this uh, stuti. Ramanika cha tupada stavanam yallabhaye turasmakam tat patati te swarupe yami namah santa saukyani. So, this is how the Bandin de Vitalika finishes uh, his uh, Stuti poem. This accolade of flatteries and winsome words for which I'm paid touches upon your real nature. I'm of respect and all the best. It's quite funny, I think. Uh, Ramanika is a special word. It's, you won't find it in the dictionaries, but uh, Damodara Gupta uses it uh, at another, in another verse as well uh, in, 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 in the poem. And uh, Ramanika means uh, something like um, 
something which uh, which is a pleasing uh, pleasing thing a gratifying thing so he says that this um, uh, ramanika chatupada stavanam this stavana this stuti this uh, uh, eulogy uh, which consists in chatupada flattering words uh, which are pleasing which have a pleasing nature which is labahi turasmakam which is for us um, a means of uh, gain uh, labha for which i'm paid this is how we translated it tot patati te swarupe so what does that mean that so this tuti this tabana uh, patati um does it mean it falls well literally it means it falls upon your nature patati te swarupe could it mean it concerns your nature we translated it as it touches upon your nature or is it does it mean it, it is directed towards your real nature so this is a, this is again ambiguous the the bar could say that oh, everything which i'm saying is true because you are really such a great man but he could also say that that what 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 i have been saying in this uh, study actually discloses your real nature if you listen carefully to these verses and uh, discover the hidden meanings then uh, the, the the audience could uh, discover your real nature which might not be so flattering and then the last uh, line is quite funny that he quickly tries to leave the scene yami i'm off i'm going uh, nama respect santo sakyani all the best so as if uh, as if the vitalika as if the the vandin the bard uh, was um, was a bit um, as if he were uh, f uh, he had the feeling that uh, the prince might suspect something uh, of these negative feel, uh, negative meanings so it's better to leave uh, as soon as possible and not to go into the details so um, I think um, I think this um, uh, prashasti, uh, this Jayoda Harana, uh, is quite characteristic of the language uh, of Damodara Gupta, and it shows very well that when we read um, uh, this text, even when the verses are quite simple and not all the verses are full of shleshas, some of them are quite straightforward but still rather beautiful Sanskrit. You should always be uh, open to uh, and, and listen to the hidden meanings and uh, the various possible interpretations that uh, open up uh, to us uh, when we read the poem. Thank you very much for your patience.